Hi, it's Katrina. Did you know that ancient armies had hand grenades and how effective catapults were? The warriors of the ancient world were clever and tough as nails. From the death ray to animals as soldiers, these terrifying war strategies and weapons changed the course of history. Catapults. Picture this. It's 408 BC. You're a Persian soldier who was sent to support Sparta in its fight against Athens in the third phase of the Peloponnesian War. You're exhausted and a little seasick from crossing the Aegean Sea, but you know that a warrior must always be alert. So you suck it up. You are still on your ship, but you can see another vessel approaching. You hear a loud crack followed by what can only be described as a whistling sound. But where is that coming from? The whistling gets louder and louder, and you realize that all the soldiers around you are staring at something above you. You follow their gaze and see what appears to be sticks flying through the sky. But they're not flying at all. They're actually falling. Oh gods, you think to yourself, those are gonna hit us. Everyone around you begins to panic. You try to stay calm, but you know that there's nothing anybody can do to stop these things. So you close your eyes, say a silent prayer, and then nothing. You open your eyes and you're alive. You laugh to yourself and turn around to see the reaction of the soldiers behind you. But several of them are on the ground, bleeding and dying. You rush over to one of them and notice that there's an arrow sticking out of the man's chest. You try to stop the bleeding, but he dies in your arms. You're sad for your fellow soldier, but you turn that sadness into anger and raise your weapon, ready for a fight. But then, you hear another crack. The catapult was invented by Dionysus the Elder of Ancient Greece in 440 BC. He took inspiration from the design of the crossbow to invent a new weapon of war. Catapults could launch projectiles over a great distance without the need for gunpowder or other propellants, and certain versions of them could be used on ships. The crossbow and the catapult mechanisms were fairly similar. Both weapons stored energy in a tensioned or a twisted form until it was released to launch projectiles. In a crossbow, the energy is stored in the limbs of the bow, while in a catapult, it's stored in the twisted ropes. And both weapons relied on a release mechanism to launch their ammunition. Some catapults threw large stones or could fling bundles of arrows at an enemy. But there were other variants as well like the flaming catapult. Sometimes, known as fire shooting catapults or fireball launchers, these things were terrifying. Out of nowhere, thousands of flaming arrows or other projectiles on fire could rain down on an army, causing massive damage. I mean, who wouldn't tremble in fear at the sight of fiery objects in the sky? Catapults played a significant role in ancient warfare. At first, only the Greeks were capable of building such weapons. But over time, the Romans improved upon the Greek catapult design. They made them bigger and more accurate. They also perfected the manufacturing process for catapults, which meant that they could mass produce them for rapid deployment during military campaigns. Think of a giant car manufacturing facility, but instead of cars, they were building catapults. Although the catapult was created in ancient times, it was still used regularly, even after the fall of the Roman Empire. Various European powers used them in warfare until the Middle Ages. This invention was extremely important because it completely changed the way war was done. Before catapults, there wasn't really an effective way to inflict damage on a large scale without getting up close and personal with the enemy. The Death Ray The Greek mathematician Archimedes was a mad genius. He once famously said, Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the world. He was born in Syracuse, Sicily and was responsible for calculating pi. You probably already knew that. He also discovered the principle of hydrostatics. He was in the bath when he did this and was so excited about the breakthrough that he ran through the streets naked shouting Eureka. But what does a crazy mathematician have to do with warfare? Well, he created a death ray. Yep, you heard me. In the second century AD, Archimedes harnessed the power of the sun itself. The name of this weapon evokes thoughts of a massive steampunk war machine. You likely think of some formidable contraption capable of mass destruction. 
One can only imagine the terror in the eyes of Roman soldiers as this thing was rolled to the edge of the Syracuse wall. You can almost hear them crying as the machine makes an increasingly high-pitched hum while powering up. Then it unleashes a deadly laser on the enemy ships, reducing them to mere atoms in the blink of an eye. But back then, this weapon wasn't called a death ray. Instead, it was more accurately known as a heat ray. Sorry to disappoint, but this thing didn't actually fire lasers. It used strategically placed mirrors to harness the power of sunbeams. In fact, it wasn't really a machine at all. It was more of a war strategy. In the 2nd century AD, Roman official Lucian wrote that Archimedes destroyed several enemy ships with fire during the siege of Syracuse. The specific arrangement of mirrors focused sunlight onto approaching vessels, eventually causing them to spark and catch fire. Not only did this intense beam of light start fires, but it also had a blinding effect. I mean, staring at the sun can eventually make a person go blind. So imagine a focused beam of sunlight shining directly into your eyes. It would not be fun. Roman Emperor Procopius Anthemius also mentioned the weapon, if you can call it that, centuries later. He repeated Lucian's account of ships catching fire, but explained that it used large reflectors, possibly made from copper or bronze. Although there are multiple accounts of this so-called death ray being used in battle, its existence has always been debated among historians. In 1973, Greek scientist Loannes Sakas attempted to recreate the weapon to test its capabilities, like an old version of Mythbusters. He positioned 70 mirrors with copper coating and directed them at a wooden model of a Roman warship that was set up just over 150 feet away. Once he aligned them properly, to his surprise, the model ship burst into flames. A similar experiment was conducted in 2005 by students from MIT, and they also succeeded in recreating the ancient weapon. They used a series of square-shaped mirror tiles to combust a boat that was sitting in San Francisco Harbor. So there really shouldn't be a question of whether or not this thing could have existed. It's been recreated multiple times and definitely could have been used to protect the shores of Syracuse during ancient times. It's not a secret that mirrors and glass can be used to harness the sun's rays. After all, kids with an evil side have been doing this for years to torture ants and other helpless bugs. The Cat Army In 525 BC, the Persians took control of Egypt thanks to their cat army. But PETA, if you're watching this, don't worry because no kitties were harmed in the process. In ancient Egypt, felines were revered and worshipped. They weren't just pets or hunters of vermin like they are in modern times. Back then, they were considered to be sacred creatures that were filled with divine significance. The Egyptians treated cats like royalty. Maybe cats share a collective consciousness, and that's why they all act so entitled today. This reverence for cats was mixed with the cultural practices and religious beliefs of the Egyptian people. So this made kitties more than just regular old animals. Cats, or Mao as they were called in ancient Egypt, were believed to be connected to the goddess Bastet. In depictions of Bastet, she has the head of a cat but the body of a slender woman. She was the goddess of fertility and childbirth, and she also protected the pharaoh and Ra, the sun god. This association blessed cats with a sacred aura, so it was forbidden to harm them. In fact, if someone so much as accidentally stepped on a kitty's tail, they could be arrested. And if someone ever committed the grave sin of killing one of these animals, they could be put to death. Now that you understand just how important cats were to the Egyptians, let's get into the genius cat army war strategy. The Battle of Pelusium was fought between the Persian Empire and the Egyptian Empire in 525 BC. The city of Pelusium in ancient Egypt was seen as a gateway to the fertile Nile Valley, which the Persians wanted to control. The Egyptians saw the Persians coming, so they prepared for the assault. But what they didn't see coming was Persian cat warriors. The Persians not only used real cats to ward off Egyptian attacks, they also painted images of felines on their shields. And since the Egyptians worshipped these creatures, 
This strategy had a profound psychological impact on them. They truly believed that if they harmed these sacred animals, the gods would punish them. So they hesitated to fight back. And this hesitation allowed the Persian army to break through the Egyptian defenses, securing them a decisive victory. It's not exactly clear how many cats were employed during this strategy, but I like to picture thousands of kitties all dressed in Persian armor standing on the front lines. These cat warriors didn't even have to do anything. They just had to stand there and look cute. And that was enough to convince the Egyptians to drop their weapons and surrender. Chemical Warfare Imagine that you're in an ancient Athenian city that's under siege. Outside the city's walls are thousands of Spartans ready to rip your head off. You're scared of them, but you should be scared of something else. Suddenly the air is filled with fog. You can't see and out of nowhere everything smells like rotten eggs. But what's going on? The sky was clear before, so where did the fog come from? You don't know it yet, but the Spartans were using chemical warfare. In the 5th century BC, during the Peloponnesian War that I mentioned before, the Spartan army burned a mixture of pitch, wood, and sulfur under the walls of Athenian cities. This was a big brain move, creating fumes that would disable the enemy's ability to resist an attack. The fumes weren't exactly toxic, but they did smell like rotten eggs. And if you've ever been to a hot spring, you know just the smell I'm talking about. Chemical warfare has been around for a long time. It was first used in the 5th century BC, but it was also used several other times in the ancient world. Now let's take a look at the site of Dura Europos. This Roman city was located along the shore of the Euphrates River in Syria. The city eventually fell to the Sasanians of ancient Iran in the 3rd century AD. This location also possesses some of the oldest existing archaeological evidence of the use of chemical warfare. Two ancient mines in Dura Europos were excavated during the 1920s and 1930s by American and French archaeologists. One of the tunnels was dug by the Persians, and in response, the Romans dug the other. So, what do you think they found in the mines? Well, initially, they only found the remains of 19 Roman soldiers and one Sasanian soldier. You might picture the Romans breaking into the Persian tunnel and being defeated by their enemies. But that's not what happened. In 2009, the tunnels were re-examined and whatever went on there was reinterpreted. The mines were too narrow for hand-to-hand -hand combat. One could barely raise their arms without hitting the edges of the tunnels. The position of the Roman bodies was also quite curious. They were deliberately stacked into a pile, one on top of the other. According to Professor Simon James from the University of Leicester, this was because the Sasanians used toxic gas to kill the Roman defenders. James believes that once the tunnel was cleared of the fumes, the Sasanians simply cleared the path by stacking the bodies of the dead out of the way. But what about the Sasanian soldier who was found in the mine along with the Romans? James thinks he could have been a victim of his own weapon. Maybe he volunteered to die in order for his comrades to live. It's an honorable way to go if you think about it. So, how did they make the toxic fumes that were used in the tunnels? Many people think of ancient people as nothing more than savages, but that's not really the case. They were smart and understood simple chemistry. They knew that by adding bitumen and sulfur to a fire, the smoke would become a choking gas. This gas is known as sulfuric acid today, and anyone who inhales this stuff is dead within minutes. These were just two examples of ancient chemical warfare, but who knows how many other times these methods were used. Ancient Hand Grenades Back in the 11th and 12th centuries, people in Jerusalem were making impressive ceramic vessels. But wait, don't lose interest just yet. Stick with me here because these weren't just your average pots and bases. These things were like the Swiss army knives of pottery. They could be used for all sorts of things like storing beer or wine or, you know, hand grenades. Yes, these ceramic vessels were sometimes used as weapons. Australian associate professor Carney Matheson from Griffith University discovered this the hard way. I'm just kidding. He's fine. 
but he was examining these vessels and was the first to notice that some of them weren't just filled with medicines or drinks. However, they weren't filled with your typical hand grenade either. After all, these pots were from the 11th and 12th centuries, 1,000 years before the first modern hand grenade was invented in 1906. They weren't even filled with gunpowder because that wasn't introduced to the Middle East from China until the 13th century. Instead, researchers found sulfur residue along with magnesium and mercury. And if you didn't know, these are ingredients that are sometimes used to make explosives. Don't go researching the specifics of this though unless you want the feds knocking on your door. Carney Matheson says this ancient hand grenade theory is supported by both Crusader and Arab texts. Historical accounts from 1187 in Jerusalem mention big bangs and bright flashes that could be consistent with early forms of flash grenades. Imagine being a soldier in the Holy Land back in the day and everyone is running around with giant ceramic vases in their hands. If you didn't understand what they were used for, you'd probably be pretty confused. That is, until one of them was thrown in your direction. Tower of Flies let me paint you a picture of a place where history meets legend. Imagine a towering structure standing proudly on a small island, watching over the waves of the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Tower of Flies, a name that should send shivers down your spine. This isn't just any ordinary tower. It's a lighthouse, a fortress, and a guardian of the city of Accra's maritime trade all in one. Its origins are shrouded in mystery, but it's believed to have been around since the days of the Phoenicians, an ancient seafaring people. They were around between 3000 BC to 1550 BC, if that gives you a better idea of how old this tower is. But the Phoenicians didn't build the Tower of Flies. It was actually the Crusaders who gave it new life. When they captured the city of Accra in the First Crusade, they knew they had something special. They rebuilt and fortified it, making it a symbol of their power and a thorn in the side of anyone who dared to challenge them. It's a peculiar name, the Tower of Flies. It comes from a mix of history and superstition. The Crusaders believed that they had landed at a place called Ekron, where an ancient deity named Baalzebub, or the Lord of the Flies, was worshipped. And since the tower was already there and garbage was often dumped nearby, they just called it the Tower of the Flies, a fitting name for a place with such a dark and mysterious past. This tower has seen it all, battles, sieges, and even the clash of maritime titans. In the War of St. Sabas, the Genoese and Venetians fought tooth and nail for control of the tower and the harbor it guarded. They both attempted to blockade the harbor to prevent the other side from accessing it. But after numerous battles, a truce was eventually reached. This truce was fragile and unstable, however, marked by a lack of trust between the two factions and constant threats of renewed conflicts. Throughout this period, the Tower of Flies was a crucial point of contention, symbolizing control over the harbor and access to vital resources. The struggle for dominance over this strategic location was a key aspect of the broader conflict between the Genoese and Venetians in the Mediterranean region. But perhaps the most chilling part of the tower's story comes from the late 18th century. Under the rule of Jazar Pasha, the Ottoman ruler of Accra, the tower became a dungeon. Chains stretched across the harbor entrance, trapping ships and sealing the fate of those who dared to cross the Ottoman Empire. The Tower of Flies may be a ruin now, but its legacy lives on. It's a reminder of a time when men fought for power and control, and when a tower could be both a beacon of hope and a symbol of fear. So next time you see a tower standing tall against the sky, remember, it probably has a story to tell. Greek Fire Now let's dive into one of the most mysterious and powerful weapons of the ancient world. Greek Fire This stuff was no ordinary fire. It was a liquid concoction devised by the Byzantine Empire, and it was feared by enemies and envied by all. Picture this. You're a soldier defending your city against an enemy fleet. It's dark and stormy, and suddenly you see it. A bright flash, a roaring noise, and flames that refuse to be extinguished. That's Greek fire for you. 
the ultimate weapon against any invader. But what made Greek fire so special? For one, it could burn in water, which meant enemy ships couldn't escape its fury. It stuck to whatever it touched, making it impossible to put out without a secret mixture of vinegar, sand, and old urine. Yuck, right? And plus, who has that on hand? Now let's get to the juicy part. The inventor of this weapon was named Kalinikos, and he was one clever cookie. He was a Jewish architect from Syria who fled to Constantinople, and he had a mission to stop the Arabs from taking over his city. So he started mixing stuff together, sulfur, pine resin, and who knows what else, until he found the perfect recipe for destruction. Once the Byzantine emperor got his hands on it, he knew that he had a winner. They built a special delivery system called a siphon, which was like a supercharged syringe. And with that, they could shoot Greek fire at their enemies from a safe distance. And boy, did it work. Greek fire played a crucial role in defending Constantinople against Arab invasions, and it even helped end the first Arab siege in 678 AD. It was a total game changer, and the Byzantines knew it. They kept the recipe a closely guarded secret, handing it down from one emperor to the next. This recipe is harder to get your hands on than the Coca-Cola recipe. Even when enemies managed to capture Greek fire, they couldn't figure out how to make it themselves. The formula was just too difficult and would have seemed like witchcraft. Trying to recreate it was about as difficult as trying to catch a dragon by the tail. But surely we know how to make Greek fire now, right? Nope. It's still a mystery to this day. It was likely the key to the survival of the Byzantine Empire against countless enemies, and some say it was the inspiration for wildfire in the Game of Thrones books and TV show. One thing's for sure, though, Greek fire was a weapon like no other. It was definitely a force to be reckoned with. And now, over a thousand years later, we still don't understand how it works. Dead Body Poison well, 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 aren't humans just a crafty bunch? From the very beginning, we've been using our wits to come up with all sorts of ways to take each other down, and one of the most ancient and deadly methods was biological warfare. Back in the day, our ancestors knew that disease, poison, and contamination were no joke. So what did they do? They started weaponizing them, of course. They'd contaminate water sources and food supplies, taint weapons with plant and animal toxins, or even infect goods and people with disease. It was like playing dirty, but on a whole new level. Take the aboriginals, for example. They'd coat their arrowheads and spear points with toxins from frogs or snakes. Then when they went hunting, they'd use those poison-tipped weapons to take down their enemies or prey faster than you can say ouch. But wait, of course there's more. The ancient Greeks and Romans were no strangers to biological warfare either. They'd contaminate water wells with feces and animal carcasses, spreading disease and terror wherever they went. And during sieges, they'd even fling dead bodies over the walls of besieged cities to spread disease and rot. That's disgusting. Then there's the case of the Black Death, also known as the Plague. This nasty disease swept through Europe and beyond, killing millions of people. And guess what? It wasn't just bad luck, it was deliberate. Enemies would hurl dead bodies infected with the plague over the walls of cities to infect the inhabitants. It was like biological warfare on steroids. But perhaps the most shocking example of biological warfare comes from the British forces during the French and Indian War. They knew that the Native Americans were vulnerable to smallpox, so what did they do? They gave them blankets tainted with the deadly virus during diplomatic talks. It was like giving someone a hug and then stabbing them in the back. Biological warfare is a tactic that's been around since the dawn of time, and it's still in use today. After all, why bother with swords and arrows when you can just spread disease instead? Chariots, the original super weapons. Next up, we're taking a wild ride through the ancient world exploring the exhilarating history of the chariot, a vehicle that's so dynamic it could shift the tides of battle and define the social status of a kingdom. The chariot, the ancient world's equivalent of a Lamborghini, was a cutting-edge weapon of war during the new kingdom of Egypt. Some believe it was introduced by the Hyksos, 
but archaeological digs reveal that chariots had a bit of an earlier debut. They date back to over a millennium before they raced onto the Egyptian battlefield in 1600 BC. Our journey takes us to modern-day Iraq, where the Royal Cemetery of Ur provided a masterpiece, the Royal Standard of Ur. On this ancient artifact, you can see the Mesopotamian prototype of the chariot, complete with four solid wheels and donkey horsepower. This early model was more of a proto-chariot than a hot rod, but it marked the beginning of a chariot evolution that would soon captivate the world. Fast forward to the Bronze Age, when the Eurasian steppes became the hotbed of chariot innovation. The graves of elites revealed the Sintasha Petrovka culture's chariot, its wheels leaving their imprint in history's tire tracks. These vehicles were more than just weapons. They were luxury rides and were used in ceremonial lion hunts. The Assyrians were pretty good at using chariots to make a big impact on the battlefield. They would use them to surprise the enemy and make them feel both scared and impressed at the same time. But by the time of Ashurbanipal, the king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire who took the throne in 669 BC, the chariot's battlefield role had shifted. The Assyrians liked to show off their chariots during big events and parades, but they were no longer using them in actual battles anymore. At that point, they were more about looking impressive than fighting. Now let's zoom in on ancient China, where the chariot wasn't just a war machine, it was a symbol of prestige. The Xia dynasty gets credit for its invention, but some scholars are skeptical. They think the chariot's origins may have taken a detour through the Caucasus and Central Asia. China's chariots were more than just fancy rides. They were mobile command platforms, coordinating attacks with infantry. As the Zhao dynasty rolled in, chariots became a decisive weapon in overthrowing the Shang dynasty. By the spring and autumn period, from 770 to 481 BC, chariot warfare was in full swing across China. These chariots weren't just for show. Each one had a crew of three, a driver, an archer, and a warrior. In India, the chariot took on a divine role, used by gods and humans alike. Though no archaeological evidence remains, literary sources tell of grand chariots used in warfare. The most famous instance of this comes from the Battle of Hydaspes in 326 BC. Indian chariots, like their Chinese counterparts, were sleek and lightning fast. Chariots, which were once the kings of the battlefield, have long since retired, but their legacy lives on as symbols of ancient engineering and royal power, etched into history like tire tracks on a dusty road. The chariot may no longer race across battlefields, but its memory still lingers, reminding us of a time when literal horsepower reigned supreme. Aztec Death Whistles in the late 1990s, when archaeologists were excavating an Aztec temple dedicated to the wind god, they stumbled upon something both perplexing and spine-chilling. It was the skeleton of a 20-year-old man who had been buried there. But this wasn't an ordinary burial. The young man had been beheaded, and his hands were found clutching onto two small ceramic whistles. You may be wondering, what's so terrifying about a whistle? Well, these whistles weren't just any ordinary musical instruments. They were shaped like skulls and had a history that reached back centuries into the past. Known as Aztec death whistles, they were believed to have held deep ritual and ceremonial significance. Some have even speculated that they were used to guide the spirits of the dead through the afterlife. Others, however, believed they played a more sinister role. Arndt Both, a music archaeologist, was one of the first people to play these ancient whistles in the early 2000s. He discovered that they used an innovative design, similar to an air spring whistle invented by the Mayans centuries earlier. But air spring whistles make a distorted, wind-like noise, while Aztec death whistles produce terrifying screams. These babies would make even the most fearsome warriors tremble. I mean, just listen to the sound of these things. Arndt Both suggested that the death whistles were linked to Aztec gods who represented death and guarded the underworld. The whistles, he believed, may have been used to simulate the cold winds of the underworld during rituals. 
But that's not as fun as this next theory. Others believe that these death whistles were played in unison to scare their enemies during battle. Imagine thousands of blood-curdling screams coming seemingly from nowhere. That would most definitely stop an army in its tracks, or at least make them think twice before messing with the Aztecs. Despite the mystery surrounding their exact purpose, replicas of these Aztec death whistles are available for purchase today. These eerie instruments allow modern enthusiasts to experience the sounds of an ancient tradition firsthand, keeping the legacy of the Aztec civilization alive in a unique way, regardless of how terrifying they sound. Animal Soldiers We all know that animals have been part of warfare for millennia. Horses, for example, have been charging into battle since 4000 BC. But what you might not know is how other critters were recruited in ancient times. Take elephants, for instance. They are the granddaddies of the animal kingdom, and their stature made them perfect for squashing enemy soldiers like bugs. An angry elephant is truly a sight to behold. I don't think anyone wants to go head-to-head -head with an elephant. Talk about a psychological weapon! The Indians were the first to harness the power of elephants as far back as the 4th century BC. Their idea caught on, and soon enough, Persians were also using elephant units. But here's the twist. When Alexander the Great faced off against these hulking beasts, he didn't send in his cavalry or infantry. Instead, he sent in pigs. Yes, pigs. Apparently, elephants are easily spooked, and the squeals of pigs were enough to send them packing. The Megarians took this to a whole new level by coating the pigs in pitch and setting them ablaze before launching them at the enemy elephants. Now that's a fiery solution. But that's not all. Animals were like the ancient world's version of grenades. Hannibal, the Carthaginian commander, had clay pots filled with venomous snakes, what he called snake bombs. These slithery weapons were lobbed onto enemy ships, causing chaos among the sailors. The folks from Hatra in Mesopotamia took a leaf out of Hannibal's book when they faced off against Roman troops. Lacking venomous snakes, they settled for venomous insects and scorpions in their pots, which might be even more terrifying than real bombs. If bees were your worst nightmare, you wouldn't have wanted to be a Roman in 72 BC. When the Romans tried to tunnel their way under the wall of the Greek town of Themyscira, they were met with an onslaught of angry bees. The defenders had filled the tunnels with the buzzing insects, effectively stinging the Romans into retreat. So now you know. In the ancient world, animals were more than just food. Sometimes they were soldiers. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. The oldest sword ever. A graduate student has discovered what could potentially be the oldest sword in the world. Now an archaeologist, Vittoria Dallarmelina stumbled upon the blade completely by accident while visiting a monastery that had been transformed into a museum. The sword had been on display as a medieval weapon, but something caught the graduate student's eye. Upon closer inspection, she realized that this sword was far more ancient. The shape was much more similar to that of some of the oldest swords around that date back to 3000 BC. Researchers spent two years tracing the origins of the artifact back to its beginnings. The sword was first discovered at an ancient settlement called Kavak, which is located in modern Turkey. It was discovered 150 years ago and then eventually was gifted to a monk who housed it at the monastery on the Venetian island of San Lazaro degli Armeni, where it remains to this day. But the origins of the sword go back even further. A chemical analysis proved that the blade is around 5,000 years old. That predates any iron sword in history. Researchers believe that this was probably one of the very first swords ever to be crafted at the beginnings of the Bronze Age. However, who crafted the sword and where they learned the technique is still a total mystery. Number 9. Persian Spiked Gauntlets Everyone loves a good pair of gauntlets. There's nothing better than slipping your hand into a steel fist, especially one with claws and spikes. As for this pair of spiked gauntlets, it's not exactly clear where they were found or how they came to be, but they are allegedly from the Indo-Persian Islamic Empire. The gauntlets are certainly mysterious. 
It's hard to say if these were actually used in battle to claw people's faces off, or if they were merely ornamental. The gloves themselves are made of very heavy steel, with seven spikes inserted into the backs of each hand. This would be the ultimate glove for backhanding your opponent. However, it's not clear how effective such gauntlets would actually be in combat, since it looks like it would be difficult to grasp a weapon. Another theory is that these gloves were also called bear paw gloves because they were actually meant for bears to wear them, perhaps into battle or perhaps just to fight each other. Similar types of weapons were also used in the Indian subcontinent called Bag Nak. Variations of venomous claws were used by the Rajput clans to assassinate people. An emperor used a combination of the evil glove with another weapon to defeat his enemy. Sikhs held one in their left hand and a sword in their right hand when they went to fight, and women sometimes carried a Bag Nak when they were traveling or walking alone. Would you feel safer carrying one of these around? Let me know in the comments below. Roman Sling Bullets According to recent archaeological discoveries, Clint Eastwood may not have been the first one to wield a deadly 44 Magnum. A collection of stone bullets found in southwestern Scotland has revealed the world's earliest slingshot ammunition found at an archaeological site. Roman soldiers used a type of sling bullet against the tribal warriors of Scotland at least 2,000 years ago. The stones could be hurled at up to 100 miles per hour, hitting the target with as much force as a 44 Magnum. Now, these bullets may not have been launched from a gun, but the Romans had designed a system that was just as good considering the time period. The Romans launched the bullets from their slings with such force that they would pierce the tribesmen's armor and hit them so hard that archaeologists and historians said that they were not allowed to survive. Besides their sheer power, they also were drilled with a small hole so that they would make a buzzing sound like an agitated wasp as they flew through the air. This was done to strike fear in the hearts of the enemy, and is considered an early use of psychological warfare. They would hear the sound first, then from out of nowhere would come a storm of rock-like bullets. Burnswark Hill is thought to have been the site of an assault against native tribespeople who were defending the hilltop fort. So far, 400 Roman bullets have been found at the site. The Weapons of the Pharaohs We talk a lot about the engineering feats of the ancient Egyptians, but not much about their amazing weapons. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt not only ruled one of the most extraordinary civilizations ever, but it looks like they also did a lot of the dirty work themselves. Egyptologists have been investigating a hoard of various different weapons discovered from the Bronze Age between 5,000 and 3,000 years ago. They determined that elite members of ancient Egypt, including the pharaoh himself, use ornate daggers, swords, and axes in battle and for executions. For a long time, scientists thought that the ornate weapons were just decorations or used for ritual purposes, but it turns out that the pharaohs wielded these weapons for real. Daniel Boatwright from the Isle of Wight College in the United Kingdom has analyzed at least 125 weapons from Egypt, most of which were found within the tombs of pharaohs. Judging by his analysis, almost all the weapons showed extensive wear. That means that many of the pharaohs whose tombs are located in the Valley of the Kings would have participated in battle, and even though the pharaohs were gods among men, they weren't afraid of a little blood and gore. Greek Fire Greek fire was an ancient incendiary weapon first utilized by the Byzantines. It's also something of a total mystery to historians today. It was used in the 7th century to repel Arab invasions at sea. It wasn't the first incendiary or fire weapon to ever grace the earth, but it was arguably the most significant. What's really fascinating about Greek fire is that even when other armies were able to capture the liquid concoction, they were unable to reverse engineer it to use for themselves. Other armies also failed to recreate any machine that could deliver the mixture effectively. The recipe remained a secret, and even to this day nobody knows what ingredients were used. Greek fire was also known as sea fire. The mixture was heated, pressurized, then delivered using a special tube. It was so effective that the Byzantines could use it to light enemy ships on fire from a distance. It was also apparently able to burn in the water, kind of like the dragon fire from Game of Thrones. This prevented enemies from putting out the flames during naval battles. It also stuck to whatever it touched, making it a lot like ancient napalm. Even more brutal is that Greek fire would sometimes be placed inside of jars and then thrown at the enemy like grenades. Some of these jars were recovered from the fortress of Chania, complete with caltrops. 
But despite all this, the true formula has escaped modern scientists. The Gun Shield Perhaps one of the most fascinating weapons found in Great Britain is the Gun Shield. It comes from the 16th century, straight from the armory of Henry VIII. There were 46 surviving samples throughout England, including from the armory at the Palace of Westminster, the Tower of London, and other royal historic sites. Also, eight of these gun shields were discovered on the wreck of the Mary Rose. They were listed on the inventory in 1547 as targets steeled with guns. But what exactly are they? Were they just decorative oddities, or is this actually an important discovery? Historians believe they came from Italy and were given to Henry VIII in 1544 along with a letter. These objects were described as several round shields and arm pieces with guns inside them that fire upon the enemy and pierce any armor. Henry VIII is most infamous for his many wives and his separation from the Roman Catholic Church, but he was also very interested in new inventions and technology when it came to weapons. The design consisted of a round wooden shield with a loading matchlock pistol that could fire through the middle upon the enemy and pierce their armor. On some examples, the back had straps to carry it, and red and yellow cloth with lining to protect the user's arm. The English later adapted the Italian version to use it on ships. What's really fascinating is the concept of the gun shield itself. Considering it was developed in the 1500s, it was quite the advancement for the time, but we never saw gun shields rise as an effective wartime tool. Items like this, connected to early British royalty, are hard to come by, and one of the shields that came up for auction was estimated to go for at least £50,000 when it is sold at auction. Green Glass Spearhead Students from the University of Western Australia have uncovered a magnificent ancient weapon unlike anything seen before. On a place called Rotnest Island, students found a spearhead made of bright green glass. And just like how Greek fire was kind of like the dragon fire from Game of Thrones, this glass spearhead looks a lot like the dragon glass from Game of Thrones. It was found on an island where at least 4,000 Aboriginal men and boys had been imprisoned between 1838 and 1931. Researchers believe that the prisoners made these types of spearheads from scrap chunks of glass, which they then used in trade. They may also have used them for hunting small animals like quokas. The spearhead discovered by the university students appears to be about 100 years old and was in surprisingly good condition. Professor Len Collard took the students so they could learn more about indigenous history and the prison. He says this discovery is important because it helps us learn about our heritage and remember our past, which is important for today and future generations. The spearhead has been reburied on the island to respect the Aboriginal tradition of keeping artifacts found in their resting place. At least 373 Aboriginal men are buried at one site, the largest number of deaths in custody in Australia. Shark Tooth Sword Researchers discovered a hoard of weaponry made with shark teeth on the Gilbert Islands in the Pacific Ocean. Discovered in the 1800s, the 124 swords, spears, and tridents have sat in a vault in Chicago's Field Museum until recently. Smithsonian Magazine reports that the weapons are each made up of dozens of individual shark teeth that islanders lash to a wooden core with coconut fibers. What makes these weapons so incredible is that they are made from the teeth of at least eight different shark species. Two of the species are not even known to be located anywhere near the Gilbert Islands, the dusky shark and the spot tail shark. This led to the mystery of how exactly the local people came to get their teeth. The dusky shark and the spot tail shark teeth were a huge surprise to researchers who recently investigated the shark tooth weapons since these sharks typically live thousands of miles away from the island. There is no evidence of trade between the Gilbert Islands and the Solomon Islands or Fiji, which is the closest known location of these sharks. Biologist Joshua Drew says that this is an example of shadow biodiversity, an example of what lived in the ecosystem in the past before we started studying what was there. It's impossible to know for sure, but it is likely that humans led to the demise of these sharks in this part of the world. Terracotta Crossbows Ever since the terracotta warriors were accidentally discovered in the 1970s, the over 8,000 statues have been a source of intrigue for the entire world. But there is one specific area that doesn't get a lot of attention. The weaponry. One of the issues here is that the weapons had rotted away before the tomb was ever revealed. The warriors were crafted quite well, but most of their weapons were made of wood or bamboo. The result is that only the tips and the triggers for their crossbows remained. But this has been a revelation of its own. According to an article from Live Science, researchers have inspected the metal remains of the crossbows of the terracotta warriors to find out how they were built and what they were used for. As far as researchers can figure out, each crossbow trigger was constructed 
constructed of five parts, but because of a lack of wear on the metal pieces, the researchers have surmised that they were never used in battle and were built solely to be placed inside of the tomb. Also, judging by how similar each piece is, the researchers are confident enough to say that the interlocking trigger parts were likely crafted in a factory-type setting. Basically, the crossbows made for the terracotta warriors would have been crafted in one of the first ancient assembly lines for weaponry. A pretty amazing discovery. Viking Swords it seems like wherever you go in Europe, there are Viking swords buried within at least 10 feet at all times. Viking swords have been found in lakes, at the tops of mountains, and in this case, an entire collection was found in Estonia. In the northern part of the country, archaeologists uncovered two caches with fragments of at least 100 Viking swords. The swords date back to the middle of the 10th century, and they were likely used as grave markers for people who were buried nearby. It's likely that a battle had taken place somewhere in the region, and these swords were stuck into the ground just like modern grave markers. But of course, they had been lost over time. This isn't a very surprising discovery, seeing as Estonia was one of the favorite places for Viking warriors to raid in the 10th century. There have been all kinds of Viking treasure hoards found in the area. However, this is the first large-scale potential grave site ever found. While no bodies have been discovered yet, the hundreds of fragmented swords means that there might be remains near by. It might only be a matter of time until somebody stumbles upon a skeleton. Excalibur Excalibur is the legendary sword of King Arthur. The power of this sword works when it is wielded in the best interest of the people and of justice, not the self-interest of the owner. In some stories, Excalibur and the sword and the stone are one and the same. Early tradition by Geoffrey of Monmouth called the sword Caliburn, a magical sword made in Avalon. Arthur obtains the sword by pulling it out of the stone, therefore becoming the true ruler of Britain. However, in later legends, particularly that by Sir Thomas Mallory, Excalibur is a different sword than the sword he pulled out of the stone. Excalibur is the sword that was gifted to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. When Arthur drew his sword in battle, the blade would blind his enemies. Its scabbard also had powers of its own that would protect the bearer from all injury. Whoever wore it would not lose a drop of blood. Merlin sometimes scolds Arthur for preferring the sword over the scabbard, since it seems like this is the greater treasure. Excalibur served King Arthur for many years, until he was mortally wounded during a rebellion led by his nephew Mordred. In the commotion of battle, Arthur dropped Excalibur and its magical scabbard. As King Arthur lay dying, his last request was to return Excalibur and its scabbard back into the lake from whence they had come. The Lady of the Lake raises her arm from the water and takes the sword back, waiting for another defender of Britain to return. Hiukoat Hiukoat was an Aztec mythological serpent regarded as the spirit of the Aztec fire deity called Hiutekutli. The name literally means turquoise serpent, but means fire serpent. The Hiukoat was often represented as an atlatl or a weapon wielded by Huitzilopochtli, the god of war, the sun, and human sacrifice. An atlatl is an ancient weapon that came before the bow and arrow in many parts of the world and are one of the first mechanical inventions. It is a stick with a handle on one end and a type of socket that helps to throw spears or darts faster and further than just your arm. The Hiukoat wielded by Huitzilopochtli was like the power of lightning and the sun's rays that he used to destroy his sister, symbolizing the forces of darkness being cast out by the fire of the sun. He pierced her in the heart, which might demonstrate the mythology behind the practice of Aztec heart sacrifice. In the real modern world, the Hiukoat has been brought to life as an assault rifle made in Mexico, known as the FX-05 Hiukoat. Harpy the harpy was a type of sword in Greek and Roman mythology with a flint or diamond blade and a sickle protrusion along the blade near the tip. Sometimes the harpy is depicted strictly as a sickle or a scythe. It's best known as the sword that the titan Cronus used to castrate and depose his father Uranus. According to the story, Uranus had cast his children with Gaia down into Tartarus, the deep abyss of torment and suffering. Gaia was furious and plotted his downfall. She went to each of her children to fight against their father, and all refused except Cronus. When he agreed to help Gaia, she provided him with the weapon. And when Uranus came back to lay with her, not sure what he was thinking, but okay, Cronus leapt out and castrated him with the weapon, driving him away forever. The harpy's blade came to symbolize the power of Cronus. 
Cronus's son Zeus in turn overthrew Cronus and gave his son, Cronus's grandson Perseus, the harpy to defeat the Gorgon Medusa and cut off her head. The Pasha The Pasha, which is translated as lasso or noose, is a supernatural weapon of Hindu origin. In Sanskrit, the term Pasha means knot or loop. In a general sense, a Pasha is used for hunting animals or binding an enemy's arms and legs. Spiritually, the Pasha symbolizes worldly attachments, as well as God's ability to harness and control evil and ignorance. The Hindu deity Ganesha, the lord of obstacles, is often mm. depicted with a Pasha in his hands. In this case, the Pasha represents Ganesha's power to bind and remove obstacles. Yama, the Hindu god of death, is also frequently pictured holding a pasha. When a being passes away, Yama uses the pasha to extract the soul from the body. The pasha is also often associated with Varuna, who was initially god of the skies, but eventually came to represent the seas. However, he has a different, super amazing weapon that I'll tell you about. Sword of Damocles the Sword of Damocles dates at least as far back as 45 BC, when the Roman philosopher Cicero popularized it in his book Tusculan Disputations. This version of the sword's origins, which takes place in the 4th and 5th centuries BC, centers around the tyrannical king Dionysus II, who ruled over the Sicilian city of Syracuse. He was rich and very powerful, but very unhappy. He made so many enemies, he slept in a bedchamber surrounded by a moat and only trusted his daughters to shave him. One day, a courtier named Damocles showered the king with compliments and other flattery. This annoyed Dionysus, who offered to trade places with Damocles. Since this life delights you, he said, do you wish to taste it yourself and make a trial of my good fortune? Damocles eagerly accepted the king's offer and took the throne. At first, he shamelessly enjoyed the many benefits of the high life, which included expensive cuts of meat and a team of servants that waited on him hand and foot. Then the king pointed toward a sword hanging directly over Damocles' head by a single horsehair. Damocles instantly became filled with fear and was thereafter unable to enjoy the luxuries of his new life. He begged the king to trade their lives back. He said he no longer wanted to be so fortunate if it came at such high a price. This tale was meant to convey that while people in positions of great power enjoy a lavish lifestyle, they are also under constant anxiety and the threat of death. In other words, everything comes at a cost, even when money is no object, and heavy is the head that wears the crown. Astra An astra is the general term for various spiritual weapons of Hindu mythology. Each astra is presided over by a specific deity called an astradari and have occultic powers which serve a particular purpose. A special incantation was used to invoke the use of an astra. There were special conditions surrounding astra use, and violating these terms was potentially fatal. Knowledge about the use of astras was therefore passed down strictly by word of mouth from gurus to students, and only after the pupil had proven the worthiness of their character. Sometimes, only deities could pass down the use of certain astras, and learning the incantation from a guru simply wasn't enough. Astras played important roles in the battles of various Hindu epics, especially in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. There were many different types of astras. Here are some of them. The Varunastra was a water weapon of Varuna, the god of water, and released torrential volumes of water and storms when discharged. In stories, it could assume any weapon's shape, just like water. That would make it one of the most powerful weapons ever, if it can become whatever weapon you want it to be. The Vajra Astra was a thunderbolt, the favorite celestial weapon of Indra. It brings forth bolts of lightning to strike the target of the Astra. The Vajra is a type of club with a ribbed, spherical head with spokes, sometimes meeting to form a ball. In other versions, the ends separate and end in sharp points that can be used to stab. The number of spokes represent different forms of wisdom. The Vajra is one of the most powerful weapons in the universe and symbolizes the properties of a diamond and a thunderbolt, indestructibility and irresistible force. The Vajra is now famous as being a symbolic ritual tool used in Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism to represent the unyielding power of the spirit. Taming Sari Taming Sari translates to flower shield and is a famous kris spelled K-R-I-S, a type of dagger of Malay folklore, which grants invulnerability to whomever possesses it. It's wavy and asymmetrical and was allegedly made with 21 different types of metal. The wooden parts of the sword, including the upper sampir and the lower batang, are covered in gold leaf. 
According to a literary work called the Sajara Melayu or Malay Annals, a Javanese blacksmith made the kris. A pendekar or warrior of the Majapahit Empire named Taming Sari wielded the weapon, hence its given name. Legend also holds that the Taming Sari is so well made, anyone wielding it is undefeatable. In some stories, the weapon is blessed in a way that made its user virtually invincible. Also included among the Taming Sari's magical powers are the ability to hover in the air in times of crisis and to leap from its shield and operate on behalf of its wielder. The Taming Sari eventually came into the possession of a Melakan admiral named Hang Tua. After the warrior won a battle to the death, the king of Majapahit presented him with the weapon as a reward. Hang Tua didn't have the Taming Sari for long, however. According to one story, when he failed at a mission to bring a princess back to safety, he left it in the care of someone else. From there, Hang Tua disappeared and was never seen or heard from again. Another legend claims that Hang Tua threw the Taming Sari into a river, vowed to return when it reappeared, and went on his mysterious way. Today, it's said the Taming Sari is kept in Sumatra in the palace of a descendant of one of its former owners, the Sultan Mahmud, who fled there during the 16th century when the Portuguese invaded his home city, Malacca. Guy Bulg The Guy Bulg is a spear that belonged to the legendary character Kukulin during the Ulster Cycle, which was one of the four great cycles of Irish mythology. The term Guy Bulg has several translations, including spear of mortal pain or death, the barbed spear, and belly spear. The weapon source differs depending hmm. on the version of the myth. In one legend, Aoife, the mother of Kukulin's only son, gifted him the Guy Bulg. However, according to another story, he acquired it from his martial arts teacher, a female warrior named Skahath. You know, I just like to practice these really difficult names. Kukulin was the only person she taught the weapon's special technique to. The Guy Bulg was made from the bones of a sea monster called the Koinken after it died in a battle against another creature known as the Curid. Its uses vary according to different stories. In some versions, the spear is particularly deadly, but it's hard to know exactly what it does. In a medieval Irish manuscript written in 1160 called the Book of Leinster, the Guy Bulg entered a man's body with a single wound like a javelin, then opened into 30 barbs. Only by cutting away the flesh could it be taken from that man's body. Gram Gram is the name of a sword from Norse mythology whose name means wrath. It originally belonged to the warrior named Sigmund, who was famous for being the only one who was able to pull out an enchanted sword, Gram, from the mighty Branstock tree. Sigmund, after several adventures and failed marriages, finally married Hjordis, who had another suitor, King Langi, who was so jealous when she married Sigmund that he went into a rage and started a war against Sigmund and his father-in-law. In the battle, Odin, disguised as a beggar, fought Sigmund and shattered the sword to pieces, leaving him vulnerable. On his deathbed, he asked his wife to collect the pieces of the shattered sword and leave it to their son Sigurd when he grew older. Sigurd's foster father, Regin, refashioned the broken sword into a weapon so strong it could split an anvil in two. Sigurd was expected to repay Regin for fixing the sword by killing the man's dwarf brother, Fafnir, who had killed their father over some cursed gold and became a dragon. Are you with me so far? He traveled to Fafnir's lair and killed the dragon, courtesy of some sword fighting tips Odin had given him. Regin wanted to eat Fafnir's heart, so Sigurd then cooked it for him. To check it for doneness, Sigurd touched the dish with his finger and then put his finger in his mouth. This gave him the ability to speak to birds, just in the nick of time too, as Sigurd overheard nearby birds talking to one another about Regin's plan to kill him. He beat his conniving stepfather to the task, however, and beheaded Regin the moment he saw the man's guilty expression. Pashupatastra The Pashupatastra is the most destructive, powerful, and irresistible weapon of Hindu mythology. It was the personal weapon of Shiva, the god of destruction, and also passed through the hands of the goddesses Kali and Adi Parashakti, as well as some others. In the epic Mahabharata, Shiva gives the weapon to the story's protagonist Arjun, who has just paid a penance. There are numerous ways to discharge the Pashupatastra, including from the eyes, mind, words, or a bow. This extremely powerful weapon commands respect. The Pashupatastra is capable of destroying creation and all living beings and should never be used against lesser enemies or by lesser warriors. According to the Mahabharata, it was never used, as Arjun realized the gravity of its destructive powers after receiving it and maintained a hands-off approach from there on out. Mjolnir 
Mjolnir is the hammer belonging to Thor, the Norse god of thunder. It's one of the most powerful weapons ever to exist. Thor's father Odin, the king of Asgard, gave him the weapon. Two dwarves named Brokkr and Eitri created the hammer after Thor's brother challenged them to create beautiful things. It has an oddly short handle which is blamed on a manufacturing flaw. One strike from the Mjolnir can destroy practically everything. It's even capable of leveling mountains. Whenever someone throws it, it automatically returns back to Thor. Only those who prove they are worthy can carry it, and only Thor has done that, so it exclusively belongs to him. This weapon became popular largely due to its presence in pop culture, including in Marvel Comics and Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thanks for watching! What other parts of the mythological world would you like to learn about? Which weapon was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon! Bye!